Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part one of Bad Girls by Jacqueline Wilson starting from the very beginning. Introducing Mandy. My name is Mandy White but sometimes I like to imagine I'm Miranda Rainbow. Miranda isn't a boring baby goody goody, she's confident, colourful and cool and she isn't afraid of anything or anyone, especially not big bullies like Sarah, Melanie and Kim. Whatever I do they find a way to pick on me but somehow that doesn't seem to matter so much now I've got Tanya. Tanya is just like Miranda, beautiful, bold and bright, and best of all, she's picked me to be her friend. If only Mum could see past the high heels and attitude to the person Tanya is inside, she'd realise she's not really a bad girl. Red. They were going to get me. I saw them the moment I turned the corner. They were halfway down, waiting near the bus, bus stop. Melanie, Sarah and Kim. Kim, the worst one of all. I didn't know what to do. I took a step forward, my sandal sticking to the pavement. They were nudging each other. They'd spotted me. I couldn't see that far, even with my glasses, but I knew Kim would have that great big smile on her face. I stood still. I looked over my shoulder. Perhaps I could run back to school. I'd hung around for ages already. Maybe they'd locked the playground gates, but perhaps one of the teachers would still be there. I could pretend I had a stomachache or something, and then maybe I'd get a lift in their car. Look at Mandy. <laughs> She's going to go rushing back to school, baby. Kim yelled. She seemed to have her own magic glasses that let her see right inside my head. She didn't wear ordinary glasses, of course. Girls like Kim never wear glasses or braces on their teeth. They never get fat. They never have a silly haircut. They never wear stupid baby clothes. If I ran back, they'd only run after me. So I went on walking, even though my legs were wobbly. I was getting near enough to see them properly. Kim was smiling all right. They all were. I tried to think what to do. Daddy told me to try teasing her back, but you can't tease girls like Kim. There's nothing to tease her about. Mum said just ignore them, and then they'll get tired of teasing. They hadn't got tired yet. I was getting nearer and nearer. My sandals were still sticking. I was sticking too. My dress stuck to my back. My forehead was wet under my fringe. But I tried very hard to look cool. I tried to stare straight past them. Arthur King was waiting at the bus stop. I stared at him instead. He was reading a book. He was always reading books. I like reading too. It was a shame that Arthur King was a boy and a bit weird, otherwise we might have been friends. I didn't have any proper friends now. I used to have Melanie, but then she got friendly with Sarah. Then Kim decided she'd have them in her gang. Melanie always said she hated Kim, but now she was her best friend. If Kim wants you as a friend, then that's it. You don't argue with her. She can be so scary. She was right in front of me now. I couldn't stare past her anymore. I had to look at her. Her bright black eyes and her glossy hair and her big mouth smiling, showing all her white teeth. I could even see her when I shut my eyes, as if I, as if, as if she'd stepped through my glasses straight into my head, smiling and smiling. She's got her eyes shut. Hey, let's bump into her, said Kim. I opened my eyes up quick. She's mad, said Sarah. She's playing one of her pretend games, said Melanie. They all cracked up laughing. I couldn't stand it that Melanie had told them all about our private games. My eyes started stinging. I blinked hard. I knew I mustn't cry no matter what. Ignore them. Ignore them. Ignore them. She's trying to ignore us, said Kim triumphantly. Did Mumsy Wumsy tell you to ignore us rude, nasty girlies then? There was no point trying to ignore her anymore. I couldn't anyway. She'd stepped right in front of me. She had Melanie on one side, Sarah on the other. I was surrounded. I swallowed. Kim went on smiling. Where is Mumsy anyway, she said. Not like Mumsy to let little Mandy mince home all by herself. We were looking out for her, weren't we, Mel? Weren't we, Sarah? They always nudged each other and whispered and giggled when my mum went past. They nudged and whispered and giggled even more when mum and I were together. One terrible time, mum took hold of my hand and they all saw before I could snatch it away. They went on about it for weeks. Kim made up tales of toddler reins and pushchairs and baby bottles and a dummy for the dummy. They were nudging and whispering and giggling now. I didn't answer Kim. I tried to dodge around her, but she dodged too. So she was standing in front of me, right up close, bigger than me. Hey, I'm talking to you. You deaf or something. Had I better shout, said Kim. She bent so close her silky black hair brushed my cheek. Where's Mumsy? She bellowed into my ear. I could feel her voice roaring right through my head, whirling up and down every little squiggle of my brain. I peered around desperately. Arthur King was looking up from his book, staring. I couldn't stand him seeing. I tried hard to pretend that everything was completely normal. My mum's at the dentist's, I said, acting as if Kim and I were having a completely ordinary conversation. Melanie and Sarah started sniggering. Kim smiled on steadily. Ooh, at the dentist, she said. She sounded as if she was chatting too. Hmm, yes, well, your mum would have to go to the dentist, wouldn't she, Mandy? She waited. 
I didn't know whether to say anything or not. I, I waited too. Your mum jolly well needs to go to the dentist, said Kim. She's so wrinkly and grey and ancient, I expect all her own teeth are crumbling right away. Gone for a full set of false choppers, has she, Mandy? She smiled sweetly as she said it, bearing her own perfect teeth. It felt as if she were biting me with them. Cruel little nips again and again. You shut up about my mum, I said. I meant it to sound threatening, but it came out like I was pleading. Either way, it wouldn't make any difference. No one could ever shut Kim up when she got started, especially not me. Your mum looks older than my grandma, said Kim. No, she looks older than my great-grandma. How old was she when she had you, Mandy? Sixty? Seventy? A hundred? You're just being stupid, I said. My mum's not that old. So how old is she then? It's none of your business, I said. She's fifty-five, said Melanie, and her dad's even older. He's sixty-two. I felt my face flushing deep red. I told her when we were best friends, and she'd sworn she'd never ever tell. That's ancient, said Sarah. My mum's only thirty-one. They all started miming aged old ladies, smacking their lips together and hobbling wide-legged. Stop it, I said, and my glasses started to go smeary. I could still see Arthur King through them. He'd gone back to his book, but his face was red too. Ooh, Mumsy's little pet sugar lump is throwing a wobbly, said Kim. She stopped clowning and put her arm around Melanie. So, what's Daddy like then? Is he all googly-eyed and gaga? He's got this silly beard and he wears a smock, said Melanie, and she looked thrilled when Kim hugged her gleefully. A smock? Uh, like a frock. Mandy's dad wears a frock, Kim yelled, and they all doubled up laughing. A smock isn't a frock, I gabbled desperately, and it's a man's smock, a fisherman's smock. Daddy just wears it when he's painting. Daddy! They all shrieked again. My face felt as if I wanted, it were on fire. I didn't know how the daddy had slipped out. I tried so hard to say mum and dad like all the others. I thought daddy's smock looked a bit silly too, and I wished my mum didn't have grey hair with a big bulky body that strained tight against her cotton frocks and puffy feet strapped into sandals. I wished my mum was young and cool and pretty like all the other mums. I wished my dad was young and strong and swung me around in the air like the other dads. I wished it so badly that sometimes at night in bed I pretended I was adopted and that one day my real mum and dad would come and take me away. They'd be ever so young and hip and stylish and they'd let me wear all the latest fashions and play music really loud and eat at McDonald's and they'd let me go around by myself and stay out ever so late and never get cross. I'd fall asleep making all these things about this real mum and dad. I called them by, by their first names, Kate and Nick, neat, now names, and I'd dream about them too. But nearly always, halfway through a dream, when I'd got to the very best bit and Kate and Nick and I were dashing off to Disneyland or checking out the Hard Rock Cafe, my own mum and dad would suddenly bob out of, up, uh, out of nowhere. They'd generally look even older and more anxious and they'd be calling for me frantically. I'd pretend not to hear and run off with Kate and Nick, but I'd look back and see them crumpling, starting to cry. I'd wake up in the morning feeling so guilty that I'd jump straight up when the alarm went and go downstairs to make them a cup of tea. While they sit sleepily, I'd slide into bed with them and they'd call me their good little girl, even though I'm getting big now, and I'm not good, not always. I can be really bad. Yes, well, all right, I have to call them Daddy and Mummy because they make me, but they're not my real Mum and Dad, someone blurted out. It seemed to be my mouth saying it but before I could stop it. It startled me, and it startled them too, even Kim. They stared at me. Arthur King, behind them at the bus stop, was staring too. What are you on about, said Kim, putting her hands on her lips. Her T-shirt was pulling tight against her flat stomach. She was the skinniest girl in the class and one of the tallest too. She said she was going to be a fashion model when she was 16. Melanie and Sarah said they were too, but they weren't even pretty. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I just wanted to stop being me. I wanted to grow up a whole new person, not Mandy White. They're not my mum and dad, and my real name's not Mandy White, I said. It's meant to be a secret. I was adopted when I was a baby. I've met my real mum and she's amazing. She's a fashion model. She's got this fantastic figure. She's been in a lot of the papers, actually. You'd know her if I said her name, but I'm not allowed. Anyway, she had me very young and it was going to interfere with her career, so she had me adopted. But she's always regretted it, so she keeps in touch. It upsets my adopted mum and dad, but they can't stop her. And she keeps sending me wonderful presents, all sorts of clothes and fashionable shoes and stuff. But my adopted mum doesn't approve and locks them away in trunks and makes me wear all this baby stuff. It was getting easier and easier, the story spinning out of my light mouth like silk thread, and I was embroidering it as I went, making it detailed, as detailed as possible. They were all listening, all believing me. Sarah's mouth was hanging open, and even Kim looked impressed. I'd forgotten Melanie. Her head suddenly jerked. You liar, she said. That's not true. None of it's true. I've been round to your house. I know your mum and dad, and they're your real mum and dad, and they aren't, there aren't trunks, and the trunks were kept up in the loft, see? It's true, I swear it is, I insisted. Um, 
You shouldn't swear on it, said Melanie, because I know it's all a lie. When your mum came round to collect you, when you were at my house, she had a cup of coffee with my mum, and she went on and on about you, and how she'd had all this yucky fertility treatment for ages, and they'd given up all hope of ever having a baby, and she said they'd tried to adopt, but they were too old. But then your mum suddenly started you, our little miracle baby. That's what she said. My mum told me, so you're a liar. Liar, said Kim. But for some strange reason, she still looked impressed. Her eyes flickered, and I almost dared hope that she'd stop now, that she'd let me go. I don't know whether I moved or not, edging one half step sideways, but it was half a step too much. Oh no, you're not going just yet, Mandy Miracle Babe Looney Liar, said Kim. Liar, said Melanie, her head nodding. Liar, liar, pants on fire, said Sarah. They all giggled at the word pants. Yeah, what colour pants have you got on today, Mandy, said Kim, suddenly tugging at my skirt, whipping it up. Stop it, and stop it, I said, frantic, clutching it. But Kim still saw. Oh, how sweet, she said, white with little weeny rabbits on. To match the itsy bitsy bunnies Mumsy knitted on your cardy, she flicked the rabbits with her long hard fingers. Poor Mumsy, knitting and knitting for naughty miracle Mandy when she goes around telling everyone she's adopted. Mumsy's going to be so upset when she finds out. I felt as if she'd flicked a hole right through my stomach. How will she find out? I said hoarsely. Well, we'll try asking her. Tomorrow, when she comes to collect you. How old was Mandy when you adopted her, Mrs White? I'll say, and she'll say, oh, Mandy's my own little girl, dear, and I'll say, that's not what Mandy says. She swears she's adopted, said Kim, her eyes gleaming. Melanie and Sarah giggled uncertainly, not sure whether Kim was joking. I was sure she was deadly serious. I could see her saying it. I could see Mummy's face. I couldn't stand it. You're wicked, 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 I shouted, and I slapped Kim's face hard. She was a lot taller than me, but my arm reached up of its own accord, and my palm caught her cheek. It went bright red, though her other cheek was white. Her eyes went even darker. Right, she said, and she stepped forward. I knew I was for it now. I shoved Sarah out the way. I dived past Melanie. I dashed out into the road to get away from Kim because I knew she was going to kill me. There was a big blur of red and a shriek of brakes. I saw the bus. I screamed. And then I fell. Orange. Mandy. Oh my goodness. She's dead. I opened my eyes. No, I'm not, I said shakily. Arthur King was bending over me, his glasses lopsided, his mouth lopsided too, gaping open in shock. More people gathered in a ring around me. One woman knelt down beside me. They were all in a fog. I blinked, but everything stayed blurred. I struggled to sit up. No, dear, you must lie still until the ambulance gets here, said the kneeling woman. The bus driver's phoning for one now. An ambulance? Was I badly hurt? I twitched my arms and legs. They seemed to move about normally enough. I felt my head to see if there were any bumps. My hand hurt as I lifted it, pain tweaking up to my elbow. Just take it easy, dear. Now then, tell me your name and address so that we can let your mother know, said the woman. She's Mandy White. She's in my class at school, said Arthur King. Were you one of those wicked children chasing her, said the woman indignantly. I saw. I was right at the front of the bus and I saw them chase her into the road. She could have been killed. I thought she was killed, said Arthur, shivering. I should have stopped them. It wasn't you, I said. I looked up at the woman. It wasn't him. It wasn't the boy, it was those girls, said someone else. Everyone turned around, but Kim and Melanie and Sarah had gone, tormenting her, and she's only a little kid too. How old are you, dearie? Eight? Uh, I'm ten, I said. Eleven next month, actually. Where do you live, Mandy? asked the woman. Fifty-six Woodside Road, but, but please, I'm okay. You don't need to tell my mum. She'd get ever so worried, and she's not at home anyway. She's at the dentist, I said, trying to sit up again. I still couldn't see properly. Then I suddenly realised why. My glasses... I've got them here, Mandy, but they're, they're snapped in two, said Arthur. Shall I put them in your pocket? How's the little girl, said the bus driver, steering Arthur King to one side and bending down beside me. I'm all right, I said shakily, worrying about my broken glasses. The ambulance should be here any minute. You look okay to me, but you need to get checked over. They'll take you to the hospital and someone will let your mum know. I'll do that, said the woman, nodding. No, I said, and I burst into tears. There now, it's the shock. I feel like I'm in shock too, said the bus driver. They all suddenly charged into the road. This little one and then them others and there was nothing I could do. Lucky job I'd slowed right down because I was nearly at the bus stop. I just bumped her, though. I think she fainted. I don't think she was knocked out. I thought she'd died. She just dropped. And she didn't move, said Arthur. And his bony fingers felt their way past the kneeling woman and the bus driver and found my hand. Don't cry, Mandy. You're really going to be all right, aren't you? He said. I couldn't stop crying to say anything and my hand was starting to hurt so much I couldn't even squeeze his fingers. 
They elbowed him right out of the way when the ambulance came, and then I was carried away, even though all I wanted to do was run home. I tried to stop acting like a big crybaby, crying like that. I didn't have a hanky, and my nose was running horribly, right down to my lip. But the kind ambulance man gave me a tissue, and she put, and the woman gave me a tissue, and she put her arm around me and told me to cheer up, chicken. She even made clucky hen noises to make me laugh. Then we got to the hospital and I got scared again because I'd never been in hospital before. And when you see it on television, there are always people shouting and covered in blood and tables where they open you up and there are all your insides glistening in jelly. Only it wasn't like that a bit. There was just a waiting room and a lot of people sitting on chairs. I was put in a little cubicle and a nurse came to talk to me because I was on my own. Then a doctor came and prodded me and shone a light in my eyes. And then I was taken to be x-rayed and that didn't hurt a little bit. I had to keep still. The radiographer told me how the x-ray machine worked and I asked some more questions and she said I was a clever girl. I was almost starting to enjoy myself. Then I went back to the cubicle to wait for the x-rays to be developed and suddenly I heard mum calling. Then she came rushing into the cubicle, her face grey, her cheek all puffy from the dentist injections. Oh Mandy, she said and she scooped me up in her arms. It was stupid but I started crying all over again and she rocked me as if I was a real baby. There now, it's okay, mummy's here. I burrowed against her soft front and smelt her warm toast and talcum smell. I felt so bad about telling Muck Kim and the others that she wasn't my real mum that I cried harder. Hang on, Poppet. I'm going to get a nurse. They must give you something to stop the pain. You never make a fuss like this. You're always such a brave girl. No, don't go. I don't need the nurse. It doesn't hurt much, really. Oh, mum, I've broken my glasses. I'm ever so sorry. Mum didn't mind a bit about my glasses, even though they'd cost a lot of money. We ought to be able to super glue them okay, she said. I wish we could fix your poor old arm as easily. I'm sure it's broken. It turned out it wasn't broken at all. I just had a bad sprain, so they bandaged it up and put it in a sling. There, all done, said the nurse, folding up the ends of the sling neatly. Don't jump under any more buses, young Mandy. I smiled politely, but Mum looked fierce. She didn't jump, she was pushed, said Mum. The nurse wasn't paying proper attention as she rolled bandages. She smiled as if Mum were joking. It's not funny. Mum burst out. It's a very serious matter. She could easily have been killed. Mum, I hissed. She sounded really crossed. I'd never heard her be so rude to anyone before. She put her arm around me to help me, and yet her own arm was shaking. Come along, Mandy, she said, and she whisked me out of the cubicle and down the corridor, so fast our shoes squeaked on the polished floor. There was a bus stop right outside the hospital, but Mum got us a taxi instead. I can only remember going in a taxi a couple of times before. If I wasn't so worried, I've enjoyed sitting back pretending to be posh. The little girl. Been in the wars, has she? said the taxi driver. Kids. When our two were that age, we were forever up in casualty. They keep you hanging around forever, don't they? And when I got there, I found my daughter all on her own, Mum said furiously. I had a nurse talk to me before, Mum. I didn't mind, I said. And they didn't even think it sensible to keep her in overnight in case of concussion, said Mum. But the doctor looked in my eyes and checked me all over, I said. Well, as soon as we get home, I'm calling out Dr Mansfield and we'll see what he thinks, said Mum. She made me go to bed when I got home, though I kept insisting I was perfectly all right. She had to help me get undressed because it was so awkward managing with my arm in a sling, and it was my right arm too, which made me much clumsier trying to manage with my left. Mum fixed me a special sick bed tea on her best black tray, patterned with orangey red poppies. The food was orange too, orange yolk in my boiled egg, orange satsumas, orange shreds in her homemade carrot cake and orange juice to drink. I scrabbled under my pillow for Olivia Orangutan. I collect monkeys. I've got 22 now. Some are really old and were mummy's monkeys when she was a little girl. There's a huge great gorilla almost as big as me that daddy gave me last Christmas. I like them all, but my favourite is Olivia. She's only as big as my hand and she's very soft and very hairy and very orange. I tucked her in beside me and I fed her some of my orange treat tea. When we were both finished, I gave her a little ride in my sling. Mind your arm, said mum. That sling is so you can rest it. Don't jiggle it about like that. She sat down on the side of the bed, looking very serious. Now, sweetheart, I want you to tell me exactly what happened. My heart started pounding under, under my nightie. I clutched Olivia with my good hand. I looked down at the empty dishes on the poppy tray. You know what happened, Mum. I ran out in the road and the bus came. I'm sorry. I know I should have looked first. I won't ever do it again. I swear I won't. Don't be cross. I'm not cross with you, Mandy, said Mum. Now, tell me why you ran out into the road. But the doorbell went, distracting us. It was Dr Mansfield who'd just finished his evening surgery. He was nice at first and he admired Olivia and all my other monkeys and he complimented my bandage and sling too, saying Mum had done a very professional job. 
The nurse at the hospital did it, I said, and then Dr Mansfield got very irritated with Mum, saying that there was really no point in him examining me if I'd already been treated at the hospital. I got all knotted up inside while they argued. I slid further and further under the covers, wishing I could snuggle right underneath and play caves with my monkey collection. I didn't want to resurface even after Dr Mansfield went, because I knew Mum was going to start asking questions again, and I didn't want to say, so I pretended to be sleepy and I said I wanted to have a little nap. Mum usually thought little naps a good idea, but now she started feeling my forehead and asking if my head was hurting. I sus that you feel sleepy if you get concussion. I started to worry whether I did have it after all, because I really was starting to get a pain in my head. I got scared and Mum got scared too, though she kept telling me that I'd be fine and I mustn't worry. Then we heard the car outside and it was Dad back from London. He came running up the stairs when he heard the tone of Mum's voice. He never looks quite like Daddy when he's in a stripy office suit. He always has a shower and changes into his fisherman's smock and baggy old trousers the minute he gets in. And it's as if he's screwed on a new happy old dad face too. But now he forgot all about changing. He sat on my bed while mum said all this stuff. She started calmly, but her voice got higher and higher. And when she told how she came back from the dentist to find a woman waiting on her doorstep to tell her I'd been in an accident, she burst into tears. Don't mum, I said, starting to cry too. I'm sorry. But I'm really all right now. I think my headache's just an ordinary one and my wrist doesn't hurt at all. You, d you don't cry, please. Dad put his arms around both of us until we both quietened down. Mum went off to make us all a cup of tea, still sniffling. Dad gave me an extra cuddle. Just so long as you're safe and sound, Poppet. Don't worry about Mum. She's having a bit of a bother with her nerves just now and she's having to have all this horrid root canal work. And now you bump into a bus, old girl. Poor Mum. Poor Mandy. He made Olivia wipe my eyes with her soft paws, and I was laughing by the time Mum came back to my room with the tea tray. I hoped it was all sorted out, but then Mum started on about what the woman had told her, all this stuff about me being chased by these girls, and Dad sat up straight, and I knew there wasn't going to be any more laughing. Which girls chased you, Mandy? said Dad. It's those three again, isn't it? said Mum. Melanie and that really nasty big girl, and the showy little girl with the curls. I can't understand how Melanie can be so horrid. She seemed such a nice girl, and I really got on well with her mother. I'm going to phone her up and... No, no, you mustn't, I said. Of course we've got to have this out, said Mum. Their mothers need to be told. I should have tackled this right from the start when they turned on you. And we'll have to go to the school too and tell your teacher. No, you can't, I said desperately. Now, now, calm down, Mandy. Hey, you're spilling all your tea. Why are you getting in such a state? Have these girls really threatened you? Have they made you keep it all a secret? Are you really scared of them, Dad asked. Of course she's scared. The poor little thing... So scared, she ran right out into the road. Oh dear, when I think about what could have happened, she could have gone right under the bus and... Mum was getting tearful again. Mandy, you've got to tell us exactly what these girls did, said Dad. They didn't do anything, I said frantically. I wish you wouldn't keep on going on about it. And, and you mustn't tell their mums or anyone at school or else. Or else what, pet, said Dad. They'll all hate me, I wailed. Don't be silly, Mandy. How could anyone ever hate you, said Mum. You're a lovely girl. All your teachers always say you're a pleasure to have in their class. I suppose those girls are just jealous because you always come top and you're obviously well loved and cared for. for I know her Melanie's mother was very worried that her d divorce had badly unsettled Melanie, but still that's no excuse for bullying, chasing you right out into the road. It wasn't Melanie, it was Kim, I sobbed. Ah, which one is she, said Dad. That big girl, the one who looks much older than her age. I've always thought her a nasty piece of work. I've heard her say some silly things behind my back, said Mum. So what was she saying to you this afternoon, Mandy? I... I can't remember. Now then, sweetheart, it's quite important that you try, said Dad. We're really, we've really got to get to the bottom of this, even though it's upsetting. She does frighten you, this Kim, doesn't she? Does she ever hit you? No. Are you sure, Mandy? She's so much bigger than you, and when she was chasing you, are you certain she didn't push you? No, she didn't. I swear she didn't, I said. Look, please, I don't want to talk about it. I had Mum on one side of me. Dad, the other. I felt smothered between them and there was no getting away, no stopping their questions. I know it's upsetting for you, pet, but we've got to know, said Dad. Why were you running from them? I just, I just wanted to get home. But what were you, what were they saying, said Mum. I said, I don't remember, I shouted. Mandy, they were both looking at me. So serious, so sorrowful. Come along, Mandy. We've never had any secrets in our family, said Mum. You can tell us anything, said Dad. But I couldn't tell. I really, truly don't remember, I insisted. It's making my head hurt just thinking about it. Please, can't I just go to sleep? Please. So they had to give in. I lay there in my bedroom after they tiptoed downstairs. It wasn't anywhere near dark. It wasn't my proper bedtime yet. 
I wasn't the slightest bit sleepy. I couldn't stop thinking about Kim and Sarah and Melanie. I wished I wasn't Mandy White. I started pretending. Okay, I wasn't boring baby goody goody Mandy White anymore. I was Miranda Rainbow. Rainbow. I was cool. I was colourful. I wore loads of makeup and I had this ultra hip hairstyle. I wore the most amazing super sexy clothes. I had pierced ears and I studded my nose. I didn't have a mum. I didn't have a dad. I lived all by myself in this incredible modern flat. Sometimes my friends stayed overnight at my place. I had heaps of friends and they all begged me to be their best friend. I fell asleep being Miranda Rainbow. But then mum woke me up, tucking the covers over me, and I couldn't get back to sleep for ages. I couldn't stop myself being Mandy White in the middle of the night. I tossed and turned as the quarter hours chimed, thinking about going to school tomorrow, thinking about Melanie and Sarah and Kim. Mum brought me breakfast in bed on the poppy tray. She felt my forehead and looked at my face. You still look very peaky and you've got dark circles under your eyes. I think you better, you're better off having a quiet day in bed, just to be on the safe side, said Mum. For once, I was so glad that my mum was such a worrier and always fussing. I didn't have to face Kim and Melanie and Sarah. I could stay at home, safe. Mum phoned up her work and pretended she was sick. It's not really a fib, Mandy, she said uncomfortably. My teeth are still playing up. But you could have gone to work, Mum. I'd be fine by myself, I said. I'd much sooner stay home with you, darling, said Mum. Mum didn't like her work much now anyway. She was a company director's secretary, but her company had changed its director and this new one was young and Mum didn't think much of him. She job shared with another lady and Mum didn't think much of the afternoon secretary either. She was young too. She got in a bit of a state telling me all about them and I got bored, but tried to nod in all the right places. Then Mum tried hard to play with me, but that got a bit boring too. I was glad when she went downstairs to get started on lunch. I tried doing some colouring with my felt tips, but my wrist hurt too much. I, felt I got so fed up, I tipped the tin up. There were rainbow felt tips scattered all over the carpet. I got out of bed, sighing, and started picking them all up. Several had rolled right over to the window. I wandered over and stared out, not really focusing through my glued-together glasses. Someone was rocking the pram in the garden over the road. There were always babies over there. Mrs Williams was a foster mother, but the person at the pram certainly wasn't Mrs Williams. She's big and she wears old Indian clothes. This person was small and startling. I thought she was a grown-up at first. She was wearing very short shorts and a top that showed her tummy and great clacky high heels. But when I screwed up my eyes to have a proper stare, I saw her face wasn't really that old, though she was wearing lots of makeup. She had a short sticky up hair, bright orange, the exact colour of Olivia Orangutan's fur. She looked up and saw me staring at her at the window. She crossed her eyes and stuck her tongue out and then she waved at me as if we knew each other. And that is where we will leave part one of Bad Girls by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with lots more stories and videos coming on my channel. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye bye.